It's 42 years since the medical profession declared that a mysterious cluster of cancers and ailments had a single diagnosis, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS. In November 1982, the first case of AIDS was diagnosed in Australia. It was the start of a global pandemic that, according to the World Health Organization, has seen more than 88 million people infected with the HIV virus, which can trigger AIDS. Of those, about 42 million have died of the disease. In the 1980s, fear of HIV and AIDS was everywhere, and it fed into a reactionary moral panic, given that in developed countries like Australia, those contracting HIV were mostly gay men and intravenous drug users. In the 1980s, life expectancy for those diagnosed with AIDS was three years, according to the US National Institutes of Health, and that meant nurses found themselves on the front line of care. But nurses didn't just play their traditional role. In Australia, unionised nurses found themselves in conflict with most doctors and developing an approach to HIV that focused on involving the community. They also had to navigate the tensions generated by homophobia. It's a story that needs to be told, and thankfully it has been, in a new book entitled Critical Care, Nurses on the Frontline of Australia's AIDS Crisis, and I'll put the details in the show notes. I'm delighted to be joined today by the author Geraldine Feller, a Labour movement historian and member of Solidarity. You're listening to The Sound of Solidarity, brought to you by Solidarity. We're a revolutionary socialist group in Australia, and if you'd like to find out more about us, our website is solidarity.net.au. I'm David Glanz, and I'm recording this episode on unceded Wurundjeri land in Narm or Melbourne. So welcome, Geraldine. Thanks for having me, David. Congratulations on the book. It's a big achievement and a valuable addition to labour movement history in this country. But given that many listeners wouldn't have been around in the 1980s or maybe even the 1990s, can we start by describing both the impact of AIDS and the moral panic at the time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so AIDS hit in the kind of aftermath of the peak of the gay liberation movement in certainly in Australia and, and elsewhere in the world. And it brought with it a very vicious backlash. So particularly, uh, as, you, as you said earlier, in, you know, in the kind of global north, in places like Australia and the US, uh, initially the, the main communities affected by HIV or AIDS then were gay men. Um, so it seemed to a lot of people to confirm all kinds of homophobic ideas about gay men or about gay people in general, that there was something dirty or sick or perverted about gay people. So there was a kind of, you know, a very significant religious backlash, a very significant political backlash, and that expressed itself in all kinds of ways. Um, an example of, you know, a particularly sharp example in Australia is the pufta bashing, so-called pufta bashing, that happened um, particularly in inner city S Sydney where essentially you had gangs of men roaming the streets looking for gay men to bash and kill. Uh, and we know that there was around, well, what we know is that there was around 80 um, young gay men who were targeted often on beats uh, and murdered in that time and their deaths were very rarely investigated by police. So that's one example of the kind of fear and moral panic that was, that was generated by the AIDS crisis and heightened existing homophobia. I think we also need to remind listeners about the death rate because... Today, AIDS, HIV and AIDS is manageable uh, with medical advances. But in those days, there was a very high likelihood that someone who contracted HIV would go on to die. Uh, quite an unpleasant death. I was struck in the book. I think you interviewed one nurse who encouraged his friends to get tested. I think it was 11 people and just said they all died. Do you want to give us some idea of the scale of the impact, particularly in the gay community? Yeah, absolutely. So in Australia, um, HIV or AIDS was very much confined to the gay community. 
Uh, and in those kind of peak years of the crisis, around 7,000 people died of AIDS or AIDS-related illnesses, and the vast majority of them were, ga were, were gay men. So in a relatively small community, that is a huge, huge death toll. It was a virus that moved at the time very quickly. So people went from being, you know, often it wasn't all young gay men, but it often was, um, you know, young gay men, you know, 25, 35, 45, in the kind of peak of their lives, suddenly becoming sick with these, you know, almost seemingly medieval illnesses. People would get terrible cancers, would waste away, terrible pneumonias, um, very, very quickly lose their health and, and, and more often than not at that time die. We know, you know, now there's extraordinary advances in treatment. Um, so people with HIV, if they have access to this treatment, live full, healthy lives. There's a thing called U equals U now, which means undetectable equals untransmissible. So you can have HIV and have a zero viral load which means that you can't transmit the virus. Uh, so the, the picture is very, very different now. But at the time, it really, for lots of people, it felt like a death sentence and communities were ravaged by it. A lot of the nurses I spoke to, they, the gay nurses in particular, they would come into work in the morning, they'd see a friend in one bed, a, a lover or ex-lover in the other bed, you know, and a housemate in the bed next to that person. Their whole worlds were, were ravaged by this virus. You couldn't go to a club or a pub without seeing, you know, very, very unwell people. So it was really, you know, had it was it had a terrible impact um, on a very small and tight-knit community. We should remember, and it's not a focus of your book, but we should remember that in the global south, HIV is still transmitted in uh, scarily large numbers where simply the lack of access to medication essentially means a death sentence. Uh, that's right. It's a really important point, David. Like the, the absolute indictment on global inequality that a virus that is treatable, that people should be able to live with, live full and healthy lives, for the vast majority of people in the world who contract that virus, that is not the case. Those treatments are not accessible and people continue to die of ailments that they shouldn't die of. Back to the book. Now you've spoken to a lot of nurses. Nurses were traditionally seen as little more as menial servants in the hospital system while doctors had unchallenged authority, godlike powers. Now you spoke to a lot of nurses. What happened when the reality of caring for patients with AIDS ran up against the medical hierarchy? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question, and it's absolutely right. Hospitals were, and to a large extent are, still very hierarchical workplaces. The medical system in general is very hierarchical, and it's often cut along lines of gender. So nursing comes from a very particular tradition. It's the Nightingale nursing tradition, which is comes from England, from, from Florence Nightingale, uh, who was a nurse during the Crimean War and developed a kind of framework of nursing that was based around Victorian ideas of womanhood. And the British Empire took that and spread it around the world. And there's a whole other story that, you know, we could talk, talk to about the role of nurses in, um, in imperialism and in colonisation. But it's kind of a little bit, maybe a little bit more than we can tackle today. But what that resulted in um, sort of in the 20th century hospital uh, was a strict gendered division of labor. Now, of course, not all nurses are women anymore and they weren't all women in the 80s and 90s, but it was still along gendered lines where you had this kind of masculinized figure of the doctor that was scientific, that dealt in hard facts and, medic and medication, and then the kind of soft skills of the nurse that was you know, highly feminized, paid substantially less, very low status and all about care, which is, you know, has a diminished status. In the context of HIV, though, for all of the facts, for all of the medicine, for all of the science, doctors could do nothing. The best that they could hope for was that maybe they could treat some of the illnesses that came up with HIV, like the pneumonia. But really, they were impotent in the face of this virus. 
But all of the skills that nurses have and that nurses develop, their interpersonal skills, the care that they give, that close kind of psychosocial and physical intimate care, making people comfortable, that became you know, even more important than it, than it would usually be. So that kind of troubled or pushed against the, kind of the, the existing status, sort of the existing hierarchy in those hospitals. But even more important was that the patients, they didn't subscribe to those hierarchical ideas of how hospitals should run. They were young people who had come through the 70s. A lot of them had been involved in the gay liberation movement. They were suspicious of medicine. Medicine had been telling them that they were sick because they were gay. They'd pushed back against that idea. They weren't going to listen to what a doctor had to say. So these young or largely young men were pushing back against that hierarchy, saying, I don't, I want agency. I want to say in my treatment. I don't just listen to what doctors have to say. So the combination of that the kind of elevation of the role of nurses and the important skills that they bring combined with, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a bit later, combined with the growing industrial militancy of nurses through their unions really push back against that very rigid hierarchy. And it did have a transformative effect on the kind of health care that was provided. You talk in the book about, obviously, some of the nurses were themselves gay or lesbian, but also there were straight nurses who discovered an enormous empathy with their with their patients so that personal commitment that willingness to push was an important element of the willing willingness to push back but what else was going on to shape the way in which nurses felt that they could actually have a say yeah so there were two really important factors in this um one was that nursing had moved from um hospital-based training into universities so the the nurses that were coming up and coming into their jobs in the 80s most of them had either all or some of their training in universities and they'd been exposed to the social movements of the 1970s they'd been exposed to the struggle for black liberation and land rights they'd been exposed to women's liberation to gay liberation so they had much more kind of radical ideas Uh, about how people should be treated and how hospitals should be run when they came into their workplaces. So that was a kind of social movement background. And at the same time, and connected to that, there was an explosion of industrial militancy. So nurses, the, the organizations that represented nurses historically hadn't even often been affiliated with the trade union movement. So for example, in Victoria, Um, The nurses, it was a professional organisation. It wasn't affiliated to the trades hall until the late 70s. But in the late 70s, connected to, you know, the the kind of social movements, the general industrial militancy of the time, nurses' unions affiliated themselves to the trade union movement and they started pushing back against um, the low status of nurses in hospitals. They started fighting for better conditions. They put work bans on uh, various things in hospitals. They fought for better wages. And this radical rank and file that had come through the universities elected leadership that reflected their politics. So you had a change in leadership from the kind of old school to a new school. People like Irene Bolger, um, Jenny Haynes and Bronwyn Ridgway in New South Wales. Um, so they they through the late 70s and into the 80s, did things like getting rid of no-strike clauses, which, believe it or not, they had in their agreements. And in 1986, in Victoria, nurses went on strike for 80 days, which was an incredibly, incredibly significant period of industrial action. So nurses were pushing back in their hospitals, but they were also pushing back more politically, you know, on a larger scale against you know, fighting for their wages and conditions and against their subordinate role in in the healthcare system in general. You just mentioned that union organisation was important. How did the various nurses' unions respond to the AIDS crisis? What kind of leadership did they offer? So nurses' unions provided absolutely crucial leadership to shaping a public health response that wasn't about coercion, wasn't about punitive measures like um, compulsory testing, um, but actually drew on 
the kind of principles of this emerging school of new public health, which was about empowering communities themselves to respond to, you know, the, the problems posed by disease and infectious disease. So nurses' unions, so in, in New South Wales and Victoria in particular, those two branches really led the way in shaping... So they, they developed policy, essentially, that opposed compulsory testing in hospitals uh, and that fought for something called universal precautions. Uh, and universal precautions, it sounds really dry, it sounds really boring, but it was absolutely crucial to this time. So doctors and surgeons wanted hospitals to profile people essentially based on whether they thought that they might have AIDS, which meant profiling gay men or profiling, you know, injecting drug users or sex workers uh, and forcing those people to undergo tests before they would uh, deliver treatment. So obviously this would have been a huge barrier for treatment, but also, you know, extraordinarily humiliating uh, and, and, and discriminatory experience. Nurses fought for an attitude to infection control and they put this in their union policy that you treat every single person who comes into a hospital as if they might have HIV. So you don't profile anyone, you don't point anyone out, you treat everyone as if they might have it. And that is the safest way for nurses themselves, nurses and doctors themselves, but also avoids those, you know, avoids discrimination essentially. That is now the absolute like common sense way that hospitals deal with all infectious disease. So the, the doctor said it's an absolute nonsense, um, but, you know, this has now become the gold standard way to deal with infection control, the safest for workers and for patients. In many ways, I've found that this was the core of the book. Obviously, the story that runs through it is the response of nurses, but the battleground is whether or not HIV and AIDS should be treated in a strictly medical and sometimes extremely coercive way, essentially where the doctors come in, test, isolate and treat people as objects, or whether, and you give lots of examples of how nurses organised across the country, or whether you actually involve the community, engage the community, inform the community or the communities which are potentially at risk and essentially win people over through a, a process of persuasion to acting in a safer way, whether that's uh, the use of condoms or um, cleaning needles for those who use needles and so on. I was really struck by the parallel to the response to COVID and I was very pleased to see that you took up that argument in the afterward to the book uh, very briefly, but I'm sure it was uh, you were you were short of space. Can you take us through those two arguments and why it was so important that the argument uh, the the approach around community or self organisation prevailed? Absolutely. So you've articulated it really well, David. So. When HIV arrived, there were two paths that could have been taken. One path was the path that doctors and surgeons and sections of you know, the political class wanted, and that was quarantining people with the virus, and that happened in parts of the world, Cuba, for example. Compulsory testing that I talked about before of you know, particular communities considered at risk and punitive measures. So putting people under public health orders, controlling their movement, those kinds of things. Now, elements of that did happen in Australia. And that is something that the book also talks about that I think is an important corrective to the historical record. There were elements of that, but that was not the overarching story of the response. Instead, another path was taken which was, like you said, about giving communities the information and the tools that they needed to control the spread of the virus. And that was the path that was fought for by the gay community. And remembering that the gay community had just come out of the 70s, they'd just come out of Mardi Gras, they were well organised, they were ready to fight. So they pushed and fought for that response. And importantly, nurses and their unions backed them in that. And they were absolutely crucial in providing some industrial, I don't want to overstate it, but some industrial muscle to push for that kind of community-led response. So the nurses' unions did heaps and heaps of work, educational work within their membership to actually convince people that this is how we should respond to the virus because the virus was terrifying. Like you have to remember this, the death rate at that time was so high 
it was so shrouded in panic, in moralism, in fear. People didn't really understand how it was transmitted or that information hadn't been properly spread. The nurses' union spread that information to their membership in a really effective way. Not to say there weren't still problems and big gaps, but they did a really good job of educating their membership about that. And at certain points, and they actually put that in place industrially. So a really, really important, important point is in 90, early 92, the Nurses Union, the kind of AIDS working group of the um, Australian Nursing Federation held a conference. And this was when the debate, the, the doctors, the peak bodies of you know the doctors, so the um, Australian Medical Association, the Australian Association of Surgeons were pushing and pushing and pushing for this punitive model of public health response. Nurses held a conference, and in that conference they put a motion that said, and this is rank and file nurses, said we will not consent, we will not partake in compulsory testing of a single patient when a doctor asks us to. And this is understated, I think, in history, but it is an example of nurses threatening a work ban for the rights of patients with HIV and for the rights of patients from affected communities. They did help by providing this kind of industrial context and a little bit of industrial muscle to push for this much more social model of disease control. And that's the model that ultimately won out. So money was poured into AIDS councils, which were community-led, gay community-led organisations that distributed frank, open, sex-positive information about how to stop the spread of the virus. Needle exchanges were established, um, which at the time were illegal, um, but were kind of operated in the edges of the law and then were legalised into the 80s to stop the transmission of the virus through injecting drug use. Uh, and similarly, there were outreach programs funded for sex workers. So this was a really important community response to the virus that meant that in Australia, unlike places like the US, it never spread substantially beyond the gay community. So that they eschewed punitive and coercive public health measures. I think... Tragically, with COVID, we saw none of those lessons learned. COVID was the exact opposite of the HIV response. Um, you know, we saw there was no sense in which communities were really given power, control, resources to shape their own responses to HIV. Um, we weren't kind of given information and help to stop the spread ourselves. Instead, we had this extremely punitive, extremely coercive response to the virus. Um, and I think, you know, we saw it most obviously in Melbourne um, with the public housing tower lockdowns where, you know, some of the most oppressed and vulnerable people in our community were imprisoned in their homes, for some for, some for months on end in, through rolling quarantine. And the result, I think, will be terrible. And years down the track, how people relate to the medical system, their trust in accessing healthcare will be severely diminished because of the trauma of that experience. Mm, absolutely. I remember in a previous episode, maybe a couple of years ago, talking to Celeste Little, who's uh, an Arenda woman from Central Australia and now working in the union movement in Melbourne. And she said, what, what's needed is patient explaining, particularly she yeah. was talking about First Nations communities and there was no patient explaining we just basically had a hammer come down on our heads and it's a real shame and I hope that some people who read your book relearn some of those lessons um, from the from the AIDS yeah. response. Just one more thing about this because I think the thing that was so important about the, the response to HIV was that it cast affected communities as the solution to the spread of the virus. These are the communities that are gonna help us stop the spread, not the problem. The COVID response cast us as the problem. <laughs> we had to be stopped, not the virus. And I think that difference is really, really important in understanding the two responses. Now, talking of First Nations people, they were seen as being particularly at risk of dying from AIDS. And thankfully, it didn't turn out that way. Tell us about the work of Auntie Grace Glenn and others like her in helping Indigenous communities protect themselves. 
Yeah, so the story of HIV and Indigenous communities is a really extraordinary one. Um, when HIV you know, first started spreading in the Australian community, there were all of these kind of pundits, people in the, again, from the medical establishment saying, you know, this will be the end of Indigenous Australia. And obviously, I mean, that is just a reiteration of the kind of racist colonial idea of smoothing the dying pillow. Indigenous communities rejected that and said, no, no, we can find the solutions to this problem. The solutions are in our communities. So what you had was figures like Arnie Graceland Smallwood, who is uh, an extraordinary um, Birugaba, Kalkadoon and South Sea Islander woman. Um, she grew up in Townsville. And she was influenced and inspired by the land rights movement in the 60s and 70s, the Black Power movement, and the politics of self-determination and community control that came with those movements of black rights. She helped establish in the late 70s the first uh, Aboriginal-controlled, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander-controlled medical service in Townsville. She was a nurse there. And when HIV emerged, she took that those politics of self-determination, of community control, and she applied them to this crisis. She's just one example um, but she's a very important one she went around developing community controlled responses or, or helping community health services develop responses to hiv around health promotion uh, and most famously condom man um, which some people listening might remember but condom man was the first nation superhero uh, who was all over posters he kind of looked like the the phantom and his line was don't be shame be game use condoms and that was developed, that campaign that just became ubiquitous at the time, was developed at a workshop that Arnie Graceland and a bunch of other um, Aboriginal healthcare workers ran in Townsville with heaps of diff different people from the community, heaps of elders came in, and they developed this health promotion campaign that spoke directly to their communities uh, with a really clear and positive safe sex directive. And importantly, I think with Condom Man, and it kind of speaks to my earlier point, it cast First Nations people as the hero in responding to the virus, not just victims or potential victims, but actual agent, agents and heroes who could take this virus on. And that the politics or the core of that response was replicated in community-controlled health organisations across the country. There were really, really successful health promotion campaigns that were developed from the bottom up from these community controlled organizations and they did stop the spread substantially of HIV so today you know there's been spikes over time but today the rate of HIV diagnosis in indigenous communities is about parity with the non-indigenous community um, and we know of course that the oppression that the social oppression that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face means that for many transmissible viruses, that's not the case. Mm. But with HIV, it is. And I think that that is a legacy of this, this really powerful community response. There are some really heartening examples in the book of people pushing back against the rampant homophobia that characterised Australia in the 1980s. So how were nurses and others able to turn the tide? Not that homophobia has been eradicated, but how was it pushed back as a phenomenon in society? So nurses, I guess, were one part of the puzzle. Nurses played a kind of important role backing up the gay community, being part of initiatives that gay community organisations took in the 80s and 90s to kind of confront and challenge homophobia. So that, that was really important. I think what I spoke about earlier in terms of the education work that the union did was also really important. So they ran workshops, um, they toured, a, like they did little speaking tours through union branches of HIV positive nurses, for example, to dispel some of the myths um, and, and ideas and fears that people had about the virus. I guess sort of bread and butter social movement union work was really important. But I, I also... I don't want to be too rosy about it because there were also some really hot, horrible stories that people told me. And, you know, nurses, like all, you know, workforces reflect society, reflect capitalism and, you know, the ideas that circulate under capitalism. 
And there were quite countless examples um, that people gave me of, you know, the nurse unit manager would say, in, and this is particularly in city in hospitals outside Sydney and Melbourne, the nurse unit manager would say, who wants to look after this person? They've got AIDS and 50% of the room would say, not me. I had one nurse tell me that when she was, she was from Canberra, when she was caring for a man with, with AIDS, that the other, some of the other nurses asked her to use a different toilet. You know, homophobia, fear and prejudice was very much alive, well, and putting its roots in at that time and, and in the um, you know, nursing workforce. I guess what is really heartening, though, is that there were other nurses who stood up and challenged that um, really successfully. And, you know, some of the stories that I heard of people, you know, for example, nurses fighting for the right of their patient's partner to come in and be with them while they died and telling the parents who wanted to throw the partner out of the room, actually, you can't do that, standing up for their patient's rights on a very kind of everyday level. Uh, that was very, very important. Now, your book is a work of labour movement history. It's not one that's focused on theory. But looking back now uh, at your research, are there any broader insights and lessons that you would like to draw from these struggles? Yeah, I think that's a good question. There's a few things. I mean, one of them is, I guess, the power and the importance of the rank and file. And that's something that came through quite a bit and I, I kind of alluded to it before, but you did have a situation sometimes where the leadership of the union, you know, might have a very good progressive policy on HIV, but whether or not that actually played out at the level of the hospital was very much down to who was there working, very much down to the rank and file and their ability to carry that. And often there would be gaps and that didn't happen. And you had situations, you know, of, nurses and patients being discriminated against by their colleagues um, and, and homophobia going unchallenged. But where you had a strong political rank and file who were you know, often influenced by you know, the gay liberation movement or you know, social movement ideas more generally, that's when you had that you know, very good policy put into practice and that homophobia pushed back. So that's, that was really, really important. I think, I mean, this isn't really theoretical, but in terms of a more general, like more generally thinking about its place in Australian labour history, I think I've got a chapter in there which kind of deals with the context of the Accord because the Accord was a very important sort of backdrop to how Australia responded to HIV. The Accord was... You know, it was all about this fan- fantasy of collaboration between the business class, political class and the union movement. And the result, you know, which I think many of our <laughs> listeners will be familiar with, the result was, you know, a real disempowering of the union movement, a loss of industrial muscle and industrial militancy. What's kind of interesting is there are really big elements of Australia's response to HIV that that was paralleled the accord it was the same time so this kind of collaboration that occurred between the gay community and the government and sections of the medical community that people argue now resulted in you know Australia's wonderful unblemished perfect response to HIV that wasn't the case and it's kind of what I alluded to earlier there were some really really big problems with Australia's response to HIV that were not addressed because Sections of the gay leadership, sections of uh, and, and, and of the medical establishment became very, very, very close to government and didn't deal with them. So, you know, the use of mass, there was mass compulsory testing used in Aboriginal communities, for example, with devastating results. Prisoners were subject to compulsory HIV testing, even while the rest of the community wasn't. Uh, and there are examples, you know, countless examples of Individuals, often people, you know, who are maybe engaged in sex work, injecting drug users, young Aboriginal people who were put under coercive public health orders that controlled their movements. So at the edges of this story of Australia's wonderful public health response to HIV is what happened to everyone 
who didn't actually fit quite so neatly into the category of, to be really blunt, middle-class gay men living in Darlinghurst. And those people suffered terribly and they often weren't represented. Um, you know, their, their interests weren't represented in that response. But there's a kind of parallel in that to, to how, how the labour movement suffered under the Accord. And there's a lesson in that about the dangers of, I guess, of that kind of collaboration with business in the case of the Accord or the political class or the medical establishment and, and um, again, the political class with, with HIV. Yeah, and as we speak, of course, the government is on the rampage against the construction union, the CFMEU, and the I think it's a very clear example of where, if we go down the path of allowing the government to set the agenda, the union movement will be weakened, but so too will be movements of solidarity that the union, the unions, and particularly the CFMEU, have supported. So I think the lessons of your book are about the way in which people can change the world. Ordinary people can organise, they can shift the uh, consensus, they can challenge power structures, and that makes it a very valuable read, and I encourage everybody to go out and buy a copy. All right, thanks for your time. Thanks, David.